Mr. Srinivasan, Professor Srinivas, Professor Krishnamurthy, Laura, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure for me and my family to be here and a, a great honor for me to come give this talk and participate in the Knowledge Conclave. I've seen the list of previous speakers and seen the, the wall of pictures of the previous uh, orators. Two of them, Jeffrey Cummings and Michael Trimble, are my old friends. One of them, David Marsden, the late David Marsden, was my hero when I worked for him briefly in 1981 and after that until his untimely death. The rest I know by reputation only, and I can say without a trace of false modesty that I do not belong in their company. But I will do the best I can to talk with you today about something that I think is of great interest and importance. This will be a historical talk. It will not be a clinical talk, although I will certainly address some clinical material. It will not be a philosophical talk, although again, there will be philosophical material that comes up. And each of those byways could certainly be pursued at great length. But what I want to do is this. Here's the, here's the thesis of the talk. I want to discuss with you how over the first 75 or 100 years of their existence, the disciplines of neurology and psychiatry defined themselves, demarcated themselves, and divided up the turf of the brain and the mind. And I will suggest to you, I think I will be able to show to you, that there was, over that first century of their existence, a reversal of the areas of interest of the two specialties. And that reversal pivoted on the subject of hysteria. And so I will devote a little bit of attention to the history of hysteria in particular. So that's the thesis, and here's an introduction to it. Unfortunately for you, one of the side effects of a talk based on history is that the slides are very texty, lots of words, and I apologize in advance for reading to you. But this is an article from the New York Times, the leading newspaper in the United States, as you probably know. It appeared just a couple of months ago in December 2009 as I was preparing this talk. And it focuses on a hockey player, ice hockey player, who was found to have brain damage at autopsy. You may know that in the United States people are absolutely mad about uh, American football. It's a national passion. And with great dismay over the past few years, people have recognized that head injury, concussion, and its consequences are quite prevalent among football players, American football players. There have been some autopsy studies of these football players who died demented and they proved to have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the punch drunk syndrome, the same thing that happens to professional boxers after one too many knockouts. That was football. This article deals with brain damage found in a hockey player. A deceased professional hockey player has been found to have had brain damage associated with repeated head trauma connecting hockey for the first time to health risks linked to boxers and most recently football players. The, the hockey player's name was Fleming and his son, Chris Fleming, said that his father went through decades of emotional problems after retiring. He was found to be manic depressive in his early 40s, 
drank excessively during that period, and exhibited striking short-term memory problems in his late 50s. Chris Fleming said that his father had trouble controlling his temper his entire life. That was one of the reasons for his hockey success, but that it worsened post-retirement. He'd get in fistfights with people on the street and kicked out of the racetrack, Chris Fleming said. It just didn't make sense, someone snapping so quickly and violently. Other hockey players didn't stay like that, but he didn't know how to react. And the article goes on to describe the problems in more detail and then comes to a comment by the neuropathologist who says, this is not a psychiatric disorder or a post-career adjustment issue. The individual is struggling with a disease that is short-circuiting his nerve connections inside the brain, McKee said. That is compromising his ability to deal with the world as he used to. I can't imagine the chaos that these individuals are suffering. Now, some of us might think that a person who has emotional problems, is found to be manic depressive, drinks excessively, has short-term memory problems, gets into fist fights, and so on, in fact does have a psychiatric problem. But the way this physician, this neuropathologist looked at it, psychiatry has to do with post-career adjustment. And this problem, which has to do with brain connections, is not psychiatry. This is something different, according to her. What I want to do with you today is try to describe how it came to be that people looked at things that way, because that is not how it started out. When people talk about learning lessons from history, and I suppose we can learn lessons from history, although history is a Delphic teacher at best. What lessons we learn would depend on what questions we ask, but what history clearly can do is shake us out of a numbing sense of naturalness and reality, that things have to be the way they are, because things don't have to be the way they are, and things didn't start out the way they are in this instance, and I want to discuss with you how things started out and what came after that. Things started out for psychiatry in the asylum, the lunatic asylum. This is one of many pictures of an asylum. It happens to be the Colney Hatch Asylum in North London. This is uh, the name from which the term booby hatch came. Uh, you see the large, imposing Victorian building separated from the world by a heavy iron gate and a high wall. What's very important to realize is that asylums did not come to be because psychiatrists thought that they would be a good way of taking care of patients. Just the opposite is true. Asylums brought into being the specialty of psychiatry. Asylums came first. And as the American historian of psychiatry, Gerald Grob says, psychiatry was shaped by the institutional setting within which it was born and grew. Many of the dominant characteristics of psychiatric thought were but rationalizations of existing conditions. Well, why did asylums come to be in the first third of the middle third of the 19th century? Why did these institutions pop up all across Europe and the United States? The most provocative hypothesis to answer that question was advanced by the late Dr. Edward Hare, who argued in a much cited, much fought over, controversial paper that the real increase in insanity made urgently necessary the establishment of, an in, of increasing provision of a specialized system of care. He believed that insanity was new, that insanity appeared in the late 18th, early 19th century, and therefore there needed to be asylums. Few commentators over the years after this paper have bought that assertion, 
Rather, people have focused on social factors, such as the growth of the population, and specifically the growth of the urban population, and the development of a market economy, which meant that people were no longer free to stay home with lunatic relatives, but had to go out to work and find some other way for the mentally ill to be cared for. In fact, in many instances, the population of lunatic asylums was made up of people who were trans-institutionalized. That is to say, they had already been in other institutions, such as prisons and workhouses and poorhouses. So it can't just be the social factors. There must be a cultural explanation as well. And the late Dr. Roy Porter, the historian of medicine, wrote about this with his typical entertaining prose. He said that entrepreneurs sprouted in many fields. Mad houses and mad doctors arose from the same soil which generated demand for general practitioners, dancing masters, man midwives, face painters, drawing tutors, estate managers, landscape gardeners, architects, journalists, and that host of other white collar service and quasi-professional occupations which society with increased economic surplus and pretensions to civilization, first found it could afford and soon found it could not do without. Psychiatrists arose in that context. I, I'll go a little bit out of historical order here and give you a picture of what these institutions were like or became in a quotation from the well-known British psychiatrist Elliot Slater, who at the end of his life wrote a memoir of the beginning of his professional career. And he described how in the 1930s these hospitals were little villages, nearly self-supporting, isolated from the countryside by their high stone walls and great locked gates. You already saw those. Inside were a fair-sized farm and vegetable garden, powerhouse, bakeries, kitchens, laundries, as well as the hospital buildings proper and the houses for the staff. Within this island fortress, the medical superintendent was the highest authority. He would commonly take great pride in the management of the farm and the quality of the pigs and poultry and garden produce. Life could be quite leisured. And at that time, it was still possible for the super to live the life of a gentleman farmer, invited to tennis parties at the rectory, fishing, fishing and even riding to hounds. Not the life of a clinical scientist. Well, this, this pattern of living and this way of conducting affairs drew criticism, and in particular, it grew criticism from the nascent specialty of neurology. Neurology arose in large part from peripheral nerve injuries, injuries incurred during wartime. In the United States, this would be in the, in the Civil War in the 1860s. In addition, of course, neurologists took care of people with brain disease. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the, what the neurologists were doing. But they did not have much time for what the psychiatrists were doing. A leading American neurologist, Dr. Silas Weir Mitchell from Philadelphia, was invited to speak at the meeting of American psychiatrists. The organization was the, that was the predecessor of the current American Psychiatric Association. And he was quite polite to them. He was gentlemanly, but he was unstinting in his criticism. And he said, you were the first of the specialists, and you never came back into line. It is easy to see how this came about. You soon began to live apart, and you still do so. This is Grob's point there. The institutional framework led to the way the specialty developed. When we ask for your asylum notes of cases, or by some accident have occasion to look over your case books, we are too often surprised at the amazing lack of complete physical study of the insane, at the failure to see obvious lesions, at the want of thorough day-by-day -day study of the secretions in the newer cases of blood counts, temperatures, reflexes, the eye ground, color fields, all the minute examination with which we are so unrestingly busy.
his colleague, the New York neurologist Edward Spitzka, was even nastier. And he said, I am inclined to believe that certain superintendents are experts in gardening and farming, although the farm account frequently comes out on the wrong side of the ledger. Tin roofing, although the roof and cupola are usually leaky. Drain pipe laying, although the grounds are often moist and unhealthy. Engineering, though the wards are either too hot or too cold. History, though their facts are incorrect and their inference is beyond all measure so. In short, experts at everything except the diagnosis, pathology, and treatment of insanity. Well, needless to say, this did draw a response from the psychiatrists. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Dr. Channing, but he shortly thereafter responded to Mitchell's address to his organization. And pay attention to his response because it gives some hints about the way the profession thought of itself and the way they didn't think of themselves by the 1890s. How best and cheapest to provide for the wants of the insane and state institutions is still the first question. The true object of the Medical Superintendents Association, the organization to which Mitchell was speaking, is to consider the practical management of insane hospitals. The medical superintendent, whatever he may wish to be, is essentially an executive officer. And if he is deficient in practical utility, though he might write a volume on the cerebral anatomy of a spider, would be of no value whatsoever. They are not neurologists or psychiatrists and should not set out to be. Their work is one of the broadest humanity, namely that of giving rest and succor to as many of a wretched and neglected class as a niggardly and ignorant public will allow. It's hard to quarrel with the nobility of his compassion, but his ideas about what will lead psychiatry into the future being an executive of an institution as against being a scientist might raise some questions. Well, he might have taken a different line of attack, or defense, I should say, because it's now possible to look back at the asylums of the 19th century and try to figure out what kinds of patients made up that population. And I've had the chance to look at a modest number, a dozen or two, histories of individual asylums that give accountings of the kinds of patients who were admitted. And it's very clear that these institutions were chock-a-block with patients with brain disease. Bucknell and Took, two prominent English psychiatrists, wrote in their textbook that 6% of cases admitted to English asylums had epilepsy. These patients were excluded from private care because their prognosis was considered to be poor. They ended up at public institutions because they wouldn't be cared for at private institutions. And at the same time, the public mental hospitals were full of patients seizing away William Gowers, the famous British neurologist, wrote that he had never seen death from status epilepticus, which, as he said, must be very rare, at any rate outside of asylums for the insane, where it was by no means rare. Some 10 to 20 percent of admissions in the middle of the 19th century were patients with neurosyphilis, general paresis of the insane. General paresis of the insane had been known since the 1820s to be an organic brain disease. The pathology had been described by a Frenchman named Bale. It wasn't known at that time to be associated with syphilis, but it was clear that it was a brain disease. And these patients th thronged to the asylums, also excluded from uh, private care and never improving, so staying there until they died, as the, they inevitably did from general paresis of the insane. The elderly ended up in the lunatic asylums. Alcoholics ended up in the lunatic asylums. The mentally handicapped ended up in lunatic asylums. And
impossible to say that a quarter to a third of admissions had organic disease of the brain, even by the very limited diagnostic techniques of the middle of the 19th century. A third to a quarter of admissions, but an even higher prevalence of patients in the asylum because these patients did not get better and stayed indefinitely. Well, what were the neurologists up to at this time? The way Spitzka and Mitchell talked about it, you might think that they had some better ideas about how to care for the lunatic poor. So let's look at what they were writing about lunacy, insanity, mental illness at the time. And just as a quasi-random selection, I've looked at a couple of textbooks. There's an American textbook, Charles Dana's textbook of nervous diseases, which came out in 1892. This is roughly contemporaneous with Mitchell's charges against the American Psychiatric Association as it was to become. And he devoted, of his 524 pages, he devoted a reasonable chunk to myelitis, inflammation of the spinal cord, a reasonable chunk to meningitis, inflammation of the lining of the brain, a chunk to multiple sclerosis, and no pages to insanity or any synonym for insanity. There is, in fact, not even an index entry on the subject. Gowers, I've already mentioned, he wrote a two edition, a two volume textbook of nervous diseases, which was in its second edition in 1893. It was quite a tome, 1,685 pages, and he devoted a big chunk to Korea and 21 pages to paralysis agitans, Parkinsonism, and 18 pages to disseminated sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, and no pages to insanity or any of its synonyms. Gowers did have a few index entries that lead to references to insanity, and here's, here's the most sustained comment he has to make. The condition of delirium is essentially the same as that which constitutes insanity, but the term delirium is usually confined to the acute mental derangement that occurs as a consequence of organic brain disease, pyrexia, toxemic conditions, inanition. The similar mental state which occurs apart from these conditions and which constitutes the sole evidence of disease is regarded as insanity. I suggest to you that these are the words of someone deeply uninterested in the topic of insanity. I, I said that, that uh, Channing, the psychiatrist who defended psychiatry against the charges of uh, Silas Weir Mitchell, might have taken a different tack because his institutions were full of patients with organic brain disease, and they knew it, and they wrote about it. And so I just have, since 1894 was the year in which Mitchell made these charges, I've just selected some of the headlines, some of the topics, some of the titles of articles from the American Journal of Insanity of that year. Uh, on the care of epileptics, the physical basis of insanity and the insane diathesis by William A. White, who wrote, uh, it is readily seen that insanity is nothing more or less than a symptom complex of cortical disease. The trophoneurosis of heretic dementia, general paresis of the insane. Some observations on the Bevan Lewis method of preparing brain tissue for the microscope. A clinical report on traumatic injury with unusual effects on the nervous system. And then it's impossible for you to read, I'm sure, but because uh, Mitchell had specifically pointed out that the psychiatrists were not looking at the secretions in acute cases, I excerpted this book review of a clinical manual, manual a guide to the practical examination uh, of the excretions, secretions, and blood for the use of physicians and students that was reviewed in the American Journal of Insanity. The psychiatrists were very interested in this. They knew they had patients with brain disease under their care. 
and they were very interested in the subject. The best example of this occurred in Yorkshire, in England, where the uh, lunatic asylum, the local lunatic asylum, was under the direction of uh, James Creighton Brown, later Sir James Creighton Brown. And for six years, they published the West Riding Lunatic Asylum Hospital reports, medical reports, which contained articles of great interest about brain disease. That journal ceased publishing, but in its place, the journal Brain began under the editorship of Bucknell, a psychiatrist, Crichton Brown, a psychiatrist, David Ferrier, later Sir David Ferrier, an eminent neurophysiologist, and John Hewlings Jackson, the great genius of British neurology, whom I will talk about a little more in a bit. I said that the asylum doctors knew very well that they had patients with brain disease under their care. How did they think about this problem? A whole lecture could be devoted to their main system for thinking about the problem. That system was phrenology. But I'm not going to t talk about phrenology with you today. I just want to quote one of the great British psychiatrists of the time, Henry Maudsley, who said that mental disorders are neither more nor less than nervous diseases in which mental symptoms predominate. When a blow on the head has paralyzed sensibility and movement, in consequence of the disease of the brain which it has initiated, the patient is sent to the hospital. But when a blow to the head has caused mental derangement, in consequence of the disease of the brain which it has initiated, the patient is sent to an asylum. No doubt it is right that mental derangements should have, as they often require, the special appliances of an asylum. But it is certainly not right that the separation which is necessary for treatment should reach to their pathology and to the methods of its study. Well, I haven't given a complete picture of what the neurologists were up to in their practices. So let's go back to these two textbooks for a moment. Dana, as I said, had chapters on myelitis and meningitis and multiple sclerosis. But he also had substantial chunks of his book devoted to hysteria, neurasthenia, and nervous women. And similarly, Gowers, wrote about paralysis agitans and so on, as we've seen, but spent as much space on hysteria as he did on chorea, and had a small section on neurasthenia, a diagnosis that never became quite as popular in the United Kingdom as it was in the United States. So what was neurasthenia? And then we'll ask the question, what was hysteria? And talk about that at somewhat greater length. It's essential to recognize that for 19th century neurologists, the term nervous breakdown was not a metaphor. They believed that neurasthenia was a loss of nerve and energy in quite concrete terms. The term neurasthenia was coined by uh, Beard, an American neurologist, a founding member of the American Neurological Association, a genuine neurologist. And he believed that nervousness is a physical, not a mental state. And its phenomena do not come from emotional excess or excitability. Neurasthenia covered just about everything you could see outside the asylum. As uh, the eminent historian of medicine, Charles Rosenberg, said, from dyspepsia to an aversion of the eyes, from a tenderness of the teeth to a chronic lack of decision. And the neurologists were fascinated by the social meaning of this symptom and devoted pages and pages 
to the onrushing decline of Western civilization as industrialization took hold. And they put neurasthenia in this context. A St. Louis neurologist qu quoted by Bonnie Bluestein, a, a historian, wrote, America breeds and develops neurologists as the water breeds and develops fishes. It cannot yet be said that we are a neuropathic people, though we are tending that way. But neurology is advancing with equal pace with neuropathic breakdown and will, it is hoped, ultimately enlighten and save the people from their neuropathic sins. The neurologists of the 19th century relished this role. And this role laid the groundwork for psychotherapy because faced with individual private patients with complaints like dyspepsia without an organic basis and aversion of the eyes and chronic lack of decision, faced with problems like that, the neurologist had to spend his time, the neurologist had to spend his time talking with the patient and it can be shown that this was really the beginning of a psychotherapeutic approach to what today we would call neurotic or mild affective symptoms in outpatient practice. The neurologists had essentially nothing to do with insanity in the asylum, but they were taking care of the milder cases of what today we would call psychiatric illness. What was hysteria? Hysteria was known by the middle of the 19th century to be a chronic disease which presented multiple physical symptoms that lacked an evident pathological basis. But it wasn't just the physical symptoms. The French internist, the French physician Briquet, collated these symptoms and wrote about, had a treatise in which he wrote about the nature of hysteria, the symptoms of hysteria. And he made it clear that hysteria was known to be an emotional disorder as well as a physical disorder. That it was caused by emotional and physical suffering and weakening of the organism as these affect the part of the brain that is set aside for affective sensations and on which is brought to bear everything that defines the passions. If you take whatever symptom of hysteria, you will always find its model in one of the acts that make up the manifestations of the passions. And I'll say in passing that what's happened in the late 20th century is that the writers of the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the guidebook for diagnosis in psychiatry the world around, sad to say, uh, they deliberately, as, as Robert Spitzer, the, the leader of that effort, uh, put it in the title of an article, they deliberately split asunder this unity of hysteria and left out the emotional symptoms in creating a diagnosis of conversion disorder or somatization disorder for the physical symptoms and left out the physical symptoms in creating other diagnoses that fit the emotional and cognitive symptoms. What I'd like to do is take three data points in the course of the 19th century and talk about the idea of hysteria, how it developed, and as I indicated in my introduction, how it proved to be the pivot for the transformation of the territory, the turf of neurology and psychiatry. This is a very recent book, just came out a few months ago, called Hysteria Complicated by Ecstasy by the uh, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago professor of history, Dr. Jan Goldstein. Professor Goldstein uh, found, she's an expert in the history of French psychiatry, and she found moldering in a dusty archive somewhere in France a manuscript reporting a case, a manuscript that had never previously been 
made use of or translated or in any way uh, used as historical material. And the manuscript was created by a physician in Savoy, which was at that part, at that time part of France, although it passed back and forth between France and Italy over the years. Uh, a physician named Despine had recorded the case. And then he passed his manuscript along to a Parisian physician named Bertrand, so who commented on it and wrote his own commentary. So the manuscript shows not only the provincial, but also the central Parisian idea of what hysteria was at the time. And the case involved an 18-year-old girl who in 1822 developed convulsions, lethargy, episodic catalepsy, that is unusual postures, somnambulism, that is sleepwalking, and a symptom called transport des sens, uh, which you may never have heard of and which I had never heard of until I read this book. Transport des sens is an unusual symptom, to say the least, in which the senses are transferred from one part of the body to another so that, for example, a person becomes able to hear only through the left hand or becomes able to see only through the right breast. And uh, this girl, Nanette, had that symptom. In her case, it was precipitated by what Despine recorded as repeated frights caused her by an evil person, a rural policeman, who on several occasions tried to offend her modesty. We're left in some doubt about exactly what he did. Well, I, I'm not going to try to summarize the case for you, but uh, the conclusion of the physicians was that the ideas of the patient, as influenced by those surrounding her, played an almost exclusive role in the development of her symptoms, the ideas of the patient. My next data point is a well-known article by the very eminent uh, London physician, uh, Sir John Russell Reynolds. Reynolds wrote in uh, what year, 18, what does it say, 1869, this paper called Remarks on Paralysis and Other Disorders of Motion and Sensation Dependent on Idea. Now, in fact, he, that's the title, but in fact, in the text, he makes it clear that he's talking not just about ideas, but records that number of case histories of what in retrospect, we would almost certainly call hysteria. Why did he insist that this was something different from hysteria? Well, they seemed to lack those emotional features. There was no undue apprehensiveness, but on the contrary, a cheerful tone of feeling and a hopefulness that is quite marvelous amidst so much helplessness and dependence, an entire absence of anything like hyster hysterical spasm or general habit of either mind or body. It seems to me, he wrote, that many of the severer forms of nervous disturbance that follow the shock of railway accidents are of this nature. On the one side, there are cases of distinct nervous injury. On the other, of malingering and sham. But between these two extremes, there are very many of morbid ideation. The man becomes really ill, but the region of illness is idea. This paper is important not only in itself, but because present in the audience at the British Medical Association when the paper was delivered in 1869 was the French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot. And this, uh, this painting of Charcot in one of his Tuesday lessons is a famous painting, in fact, uh, Professor Srinivas has it in his office, and I was shown it when I was there on uh, Thursday morning for a conference. It's a famous portrait showing Charcot, 
surrounded by his acolytes, Babinski and Pierre-Marie and Paul Richet and so on, uh, demonstrating this swooning female, whose name is Blanche Whitman, an example of hysteria, demonstrating her pathology. Charcot is a key figure in the history of hysteria, and let's talk a little bit about his ideas. Charcot believed that hysteria was a disease of the nervous system. He believed it was hereditary. He believed it was progressive and degenerative. He believed it was governed by laws that he could define much as he had defined the nature of other diseases of the nervous system, disseminated sclerosis, motor neuron disease. He was able to perform anatomico-clinical correlations on those diseases, define the course of the diseases, define the clinical picture of the diseases. And he believed he could do precisely the same thing with hysteria. He believed that hysteria might be precipitated by trauma, but that was really incidental. The trauma was nothing but an agent provocateur for what was basically a hereditary degenerative disease. Now, he knew from his autopsy studies that he was not going to find an anatomic lesion in hysteria the way he had in those other diseases. But he believed that there was what he called a dynamic lesion. Well, this is a less famous picture of Charcot. I hope it's, it's probably less easy to see from where you are. This is a less famous picture, but it shows Charcot seated at a table while probably a different female patient is swooning in front of him. And again, he's surrounded by his acolytes. This is Charcot at work, not giving a clinical teaching demonstration, but actually seeing a patient. And his students left a description of how he worked. He sits down at a bare table and at once calls for the patient. The intern reads the history while the master listens attentively. Then there is a long silence during which he looks and looks at the patient while drumming his fingers on the table. All the while, while Charcot says nothing. Finally, he orders the patient to make a special maneuver, makes him talk, asks for his reflexes to be tested, his sensory system to be explored, and again, a mysterious silence. We'll come back to what the significance of that way of working might be. And we'll now pass on to the last data point in uh, the 19th century history of hysteria. And that is the work of Sigmund Freud. Freud, just as Charcot had gone to Reynolds' talk in 1869, so Freud went to work with Charcot in 1885. And he spent a number of months in Paris. Freud had trained as a neurologist in Vienna and went to Paris to continue his neurological, histological studies. He was interested in cutting the brain of children with cerebral palsy, for example. But it turned out that the facilities were inadequate for him to do that sort of work. And he ended up uh, studying hysteria with Charcot. And this was transformational for his career, because from then on, his career took a different direction, and he studied hysteria. He abandoned his earlier interest in the brain. He abandoned his project to find a biological basis for psychology. I put project in quotes because he wrote a paper called Project for a Scientific Psychology which he then put into a drawer and never published. He abandoned that area in favor of the study of hysteria. And in 1888, he wrote this paper. This is the so-called pre-psychoanalytic Freud. Usually, people start dating psychoanalysis in 1895, when the studies on hysteria came out. In 1888. He wrote a paper at Charcot's direction on how to differentiate between organic and hysterical motor paralysis. 
And in the paper, he made some very astute points, no doubt learned at Charcot's uh, knee, about how to do this through clinical examination. And then he considered the matter of a dynamic lesion, his, uh, uh, Charcot's idea about a dynamic lesion. And he rejected the idea that there was a dynamic lesion of the nervous system. His grounds for saying that were that if dynamic lesion means some sort of lesion localized in the nervous system that does not appear at post-mortem evaluation, if that were present, even if it were swelling, for example, that had disappeared by the time of autopsy, still the symptoms would respect the anatomy of the nervous system. And what he says was that I, on the contrary, meaning as against Charcot, assert that the lesion in hysterical paralysis must be completely independent of the anatomy of the nervous system. Since in its paralyses and other manifestations, hysteria behaves as though anatomy did not exist or as though it had no knowledge of it. The lesion in hysterical paralysis will therefore be an alteration of the conception, the idea of the arm, for instance. This was not a conclusion that was easy for Freud to come to. And he wrote in 1895 in the studies on hysteria, I think quite genuinely, I think he, he meant it. And one of the reasons that I think that is that his French uh, peer, Pierre Janet, wrote something very similar at about the same time based on his studies on hysteria. Freud wrote, like other neuropathologists, I was trained to employ local diagnoses and electroprognosis, and it still strikes me myself as strange that the case histories I write should read like short stories and that, as one might say, they lack the serious stamp of science. The fact is that local diagnosis and electrical reactions lead nowhere in the study of hysteria, whereas a detailed description of mental processes enables me to obtain at least some kind of insight into the course of that affection. So here we are in 1895, and the idea had become established that hysteria was a disease of ideas. Freud did one other thing. And that was he listened to his patients. And just to make this point visually, I want to contrast the famous Freudian couch with Charcot's table. Now, that description that I read you of Charcot's way of working didn't contain much conversation between Charcot and the patient. And in fact, Charcot was as Freud wrote, a visuel, someone who looked and didn't listen. Freud listened. And this led to a different way of working with patients. Nowhere better captured than, this, than in this lovely remark of Henry Head's. Henry Head was a British neurologist who a few years later Head was, Head was one of the physicians who took care of the novelist Virginia Woolf. And he wrote, diagnosis of the psychoneuroses is an individual investigation. They are not diseases, but morbid activities of a personality which demand to be understood. Well, I mentioned Hewlings Jackson. Hewlings Jackson was the great clinical observer of 19th century British neurology, and even more, the great theorist of studying the nervous system. And in his Croonian lectures in the early 1890s, he defined what he called the doctrine of concomitance. The doctrine I hold is, first, that states of consciousness are utterly different from nervous states. Secondly, that these two things occur together, that for every mental state there is a correlative nervous state. Third, that although the two things occur in parallelism, there is no interference of one with the other. 
a strict dualism. Now, this is quite an extraordinary statement, really, quite a startling, puzzling statement for a couple of reasons. Jackson was a clinical genius, but he was not a well-educated man. He was not philosophically sophisticated. And his philosophical thinking about this subject drew criticism even from his contemporaries. And the American neurologist Morton Prince said in what is a late 19th century example of extreme snark, I cannot help suspecting that Hewlings Jackson does not completely grasp the full meaning of this problem. But apart from lack of philosophical uh, sophistication, there's another reason that Jackson is, is startling in this regard, and that is that no one, perhaps to the present day, has been more astute than Jackson at describing what he called the voluminous mental state of epilepsy. Jackson was brilliant at describing the mental concomitants of disease of the nervous system, the various odd mental experiences that go along with epilepsy deja vu, and jamais vu, and micropsia, and macropsia, and all sorts of odd things. And he described them brilliantly. And then he developed a theory that seemed to leave them out of the picture. What was he up to? Why did he want to do it that way? Well, let's go on with his, his uh, lecture evolution and dissolution in the nervous system. Those who accept the doctrine of concomitants do not believe that volitions, ideas, and emotions produce movements or any other physical states. They would not say that an hysterical woman did not do this or that because she lacked will, or that a comatose patient did not move because he had lost consciousness. I do not try to show what is the nature of the relation between mental and nervous states. Jackson had what we would today call a research program. He wanted to develop a thoroughgoing biological understanding of the nervous system, and he didn't want people cheating by saying, well, he moved because he wanted to move. That was cheating. He wanted a physiological account of why people moved, a sensory motor account, and allowing mental phenomena in was, from Jackson's point of view in this research program, cheating. You had to do your physiological homework. Now, lest you think that this is a purely 19th century concern, if you take a look at what he says about a comatose patient here, and let's turn to the latest edition of the standard textbook on stupor and coma, Plum and Posner's textbook of stupor and coma, which is now in its fourth edition, just came out a couple of years ago. It is possible for a patient to be conscious yet not responsive to the examiner if, for example, the patient lacks sensory inputs, is paralyzed, or for psychological reasons decides not to respond. This is almost word for word what Jackson said you shouldn't be doing in studying the nervous system. And I think we can all agree that someone with selective mutism or someone with catatonia who doesn't respond to the examiner is different from someone in coma who doesn't respond to the examiner. But Jackson's research program was to say we need to develop a physiological account of those differences. So let, let me summarize. Where, where do things stand? Where are we by the end of the 19th century? Freud, Jackson. Well, at the beginning of the century, at the dawn of these specialties, psychiatrists took care of patients with severe mental disease in asylums. And often enough, these mental diseases were due to brain diseases. And those physicians knew it. At the same time, the neurologists were seeing patients with milder mental disorders under the rubrics of hysteria and neurasthenia who lacked evidence of structural brain disease and whose disorders were taken to be due to ideas and emotions. But by the beginning of the 20th century, the specialties had reversed field. They had switched. <laughs> 
so that in psychiatry, little attention was being paid to structural brain disease, and special attention was being paid to the dysfunction caused by ideas and emotions. And the neurologists, C. Jackson, had decided that patients with structural brain disease were the province of neurology, and they needed to pay little or no attention to ideas and emotions. Things had switched. Well, if I may be so bold as to put it this way, Charcot made two errors. One is that he was largely oblivious to the patient's psychology and psychological milieu. You know, it's now possible to see, looking back at it, that the reason those patients were swooning in front of him is that they were taught to swoon in front of him by the environment at the Salpetriere where he was practicing. He was essentially totally oblivious to that. And it's very important to realize when you read Charcot, it's very important not to do so anachronistically because Charcot would record, for example, that a young girl with hysteria had a father who was brutal to her. And it's very easy to imagine that he's telling us about traumatic experience, perhaps sexual abuse, and the patient, how the patient's experience led to her hysteria, but he's not. He's telling us about the patient's hereditary taint. Her father was a brute, and she has hysteria. It's inherited. He was largely oblivious to the psychological milieu, and to some extent, perhaps, we can say that this error, this obliviousness, was corrected by the work of Freud and Henry Head and others in that long tradition of actually listening to the patient. The other problem with Charcot's work is that he imagined a dynamic lesion, but he could not find one. And perhaps that's changed, too. So this is an unreadable slide, I know. I've put it up merely to show that there now is a series, I think there are nine studies in that slide, of the functional state of the brain in patients with hysteria based on contemporary functional neuroimaging with PET or functional magnetic resonance imaging. And I just want to tell you about one of these studies, one that's not included in that, uh, in that table because it came out at the same time as the article in the table. And this is a study from uh, Patrick Viumier's group in Geneva. They had a single case, a woman with hysterical paralysis of her left arm. And they were able to show in this PET study, let's see, how can I do this? Yeah, these, these red areas here. Is there a pointer there? Uh, no, I, if, I do it with, with, if I do it with this pointer, then people can see it on both screens. So let me do it this way. So I hope you can see this pointer moving here. These two red areas in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and in the precuneus were the areas that were overactive in this woman when she attempted to move her paralyzed, hysterically paralyzed left hand. The authors point out that these two areas overlap to some extent with these green areas, the default mode network. What is the default mode network? Well, most studies of the functional state of the brain using imaging techniques have a strategy that goes like this. You put somebody in the scanner and then you say, do such and such a task, and then you figure out what areas light up when the subject performs that task, whatever it might be. The default mode, net, default mode network is the area that lights up when the patient isn't doing a task. It's the brain at rest. And it's now been widely studied and thought to represent the patients, the subjects, uh, internal self-representation 
when you're just drifting along, thinking about whatever comes to mind, your default mode network lights up. And what they suggest is that this hysterical patient has overactivity of areas representing internal images, internal self-states that interfere with motor functioning. And they pursued that line of thought by analyzing connectivity, what hooks up with what functionally when the patient's trying to make these movements. And what you can see here is that there are two, er these, these two areas, the precuneus here and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex here are far more active, far more heavily interconnected with motor cortex than in comparison subjects. And the comparison, whoops, the comparison subjects are healthy controls and especially interesting simulators. So this woman whom they studied, their single case, had hysteria. But they had some people fake paralysis of the left hand. And it turns out, according to this functional imaging study, that faking paralysis and having hysterical paralysis are quite different brain states. This is a result that would have been of great interest to my patient, a patient I saw just a couple of days before I left to come here. This is a young woman with pseudo seizures, hysterical epilepsy, hysterical non-epilepsy. She has spells of shaking and unresponsiveness, which are not epileptic, but which are hysterical. And a few days before I saw her, she had had such a spell. Before she had it, she had the feeling that one might come on. She had called for emergency medical transport, been brought to an emergency room where she had the spell. And the emergency room physician had tried to wake her up by rubbing her sternum leaving a bruise later, and yelling at her, stop it, stop that. And she was, when I saw her, devastated. How could he think I was faking it? How could he believe that of me? Well, she would have been, she was in fact, when I told her about this study, she would have been quite interested to know that faking it really is a different brain state from hysteria. So where do we stand? Is there a dynamic lesion that we can now define by contemporary brain imaging studies? Not, we're not quite there yet. Perhaps we're getting there. A single case study by one group hardly is the end of the science of the subject. But perhaps we're getting there. We're not quite there yet. And where do we stand as far as Jackson's comment, I do not try to show what is the nature of the relation between mental and nervous states? Well, we're certainly not there yet either. But perhaps we're getting there also. Perhaps with the advent of contemporary cognitive and affective neuroscience, we're in a position where we don't have to be quite as modest as Jackson was, and we don't have to cling to the same research program quite so desperately. Perhaps we can genuinely look at the relations between mental and nervous states and try to understand them without losing track of the research program that Jackson set out for us. So let me conclude with another comment from that snarky article by uh, Morton Prince, the American neurologist who said that Jackson appears not to have understood the problem at hand. He went on to say, if we can penetrate deeper still into the inner recesses of the nervous system and can extract the secret of the more intimate relation between the mind and the brain matter, we can scarcely doubt that much that is now obscure in the pathology of many neuroses and psychoses would become intelligible. And let's hope that uh, we are getting there. Thank you for your attention.
traditional in this oration that there's a short period of question and answer. I request Professor Trimble to join us on the dais, please. Yes, and Dr. E.S. Krishnamurti. Uh, this was actually the invention of the family. They thought the oration ended rather bluntly and everybody just went for the tea. So before we go and join people for the tea, there'll be this. Please keep your questions short to the point and announce where you, what your name is, where you come from and what your interests are. It'll be very helpful to us. So I'll now request the question and answer session briefly to start. Thank you. Lecturers feel bad when no one asks questions. It makes Lecturers feel bad when no one asks questions. It makes us feel that we didn't say anything interesting. So please feel free to ask some questions. Uh, sir, I, I'm Dr. Kamakshi. I'm a student of Professor Srinivas many years back. I have, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of a question and a situation and a patient. I'll just take about two minutes. When I was a student, I had a patient who was demented. When asked his age, he said he was 300 years old. I thought I had heard wrong. So I repeated the question, of course, in Tamil language. He said, 300 years. Please keep it as 300 years. I thought that uh, either <laughs> I had gone mad or something had happened. Then uh, I dubbed him as hysterical. It was the first year of my DM Neurology. I said, uh, this is possibly hysterical. Then my chief asked me to go back to the patient and examine. I did the exam. And then when I made a neurological examination, I found that he was demented. And then he had pinpoint pupils, an Argyle Robertson pupil. His ankle jerks were absent. And then the whole thing unraveled itself. It turned out to be a GPI along with a Tabies component also. He also said he was a prince. Incidentally, so it is a combination of a tabopheresis. Now, in this era, tabopheresis has almost become extinct. I, I have not seen, after those 30 years, another case of tabopheresis. Not even a GPI. So I was just wa wanting to share this with you and uh, ask you whether you see cases of GPI. Well, um First, as far as the extinction of neurosyphilis, sadly, it is far from extinct. And the AIDS epidemic has also led to a recrudescence of uh, syphilis. And it's generally felt that syphilis is harder to treat in the presence of HIV infection. I can't say I have a large personal experience of uh, general paresis of the insane, but it is certainly a disorder that still needs to be considered in the differential diagnosis of uh, dementia today. Second, let me comment about the Ganser state. Um, Ganser was a German physician who described patients who give approximate answers. So to simple questions that anyone would know the answer to, how many legs does a dog have, they say five. And the, the discussion has um, raged, that's probably putting it a little strongly, since Ganser's description about whether this is an organic state or an hysterical state. And um, if you look back at Ganser's description, at least two of his original three patients pretty clearly had organic disease. So the symptom of approximate answers is a symptom that, you know, Three, 300 isn't that close to, uh, to the actual age of your patient, I'm sure. But the, the idea that someone would not give, not be able to give uh, an answer to a simple question that they probably did know the answer to, uh, that, that symptom um, often has an organic basis, although sometimes perhaps not. Michael, do you have a? Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Rabindranath, psychiatrist. There have been many reports and studies that uh, 
patients, hysterical patients followed over a period of time, 10 years, 15 years, to show some evidence of neurological problems. Uh, do you like to comment on that and what is experience? Fortunately, there's now a very considerable body of work uh, on, on that issue. The classical paper uh, by um, Slater on the misdiagnosis of hysteria is a paper that I, I, Professor Trimble and I don't completely see eye to eye about, uh, but he reported a 30 odd percent rate of misdiagnosed, mis, missed neurological diagnosis. But John Stone in Edinburgh and his colleagues have looked at this very carefully and done their own studies. And it's clear that even if Slater was right in his own patient material 40 odd years ago, 45 years ago, uh, this is no longer the case. And the actual current rate of misdiagnosis of hysteria, assuming that the diagnosis is made on appropriate grounds, is more like 3 or 4%, well within the range of the accuracy of diagnosis of myocardial infarction or other medical conditions. Now that said, there's another aspect of this which has not been the subject of recent clinical attention, uh, I, I think unfortunately so, and that is one of the positive things about Slater's article in the 60s was that he made it clear that the behaviors we call hysterical, the emotional state that we call hysterical, the relationship with the doctor that we call hysterical, these things may all be the result of organic brain disease. The patients may have organic personality change that leads to these kinds of behaviors. And in the 60s and 70s, there were a number of studies looking to see how many patients who genuinely had hysteria actually had, if I can put it this way, organic hysteria, that is hysteria due to personality deterioration related to genuine brain disease. And those studies have unfortunately disappeared from the literature. So I don't think we have much information about how often uh, patients produce hysterical manifestations because they have personality change due to brain disease. Calcutta. Uh, now, you have already touched on it. I was going to ask about uh, Sir Eric Slater's work. Now, he said now the history has been revised to some extent. I suppose this is because of our armamentarium of investigations which has made it easier to detect organic states much earlier than it used to be some 60 years ago. Now, still, in the earlier stages, as you said, the subtler forms of organic condition can present as so-called functional, but that is only the manifestation of the same organic state, but the actual structural neurodeficit has not yet come. That's what I was questioning, the reason for misdiagnosis. Not that the physicians failed or made wrong diagnosis, but that it was very early when the neurological structural process could not have been detected. But it is the same process. As to the role of contemporary diagnostic uh, technology in the improvement of uh, diagnostic accuracy, I'm sure that's a factor, but I doubt that it's the only factor. And much of the improvement actually took place before the advent of MRI, for example. Um, I, I'd like to make one other comment about this general area of missed diagnosis, uh, because Again, this is what I would consider a strength of the Slater paper. Um, there is a risk of missed organic diagnosis, missed neurological diagnosis in uh, patients who, for one reason or another, are taken to be hysterical. 
And that's a significant problem, and we all need to be attentive and thorough and open-minded. But there's a risk on the other side, too. And the, the risk on the other side is that patients will be taken to have organic disease when the evidence for it is slight, and their emotional disorder, their psychiatric disorder, will be ignored by treating non-psychiatrists. And this is a problem that's associated with considerable morbidity and unhappiness on the part of patients whose lives are blighted by the presence of the emotional disorder, which is being ignored because everybody's treating them for this or that or the other thing, which they actually don't have. My name is Radhika. I'm not a doctor. I just want to know, is uh, biologically a woman more prone to hysteria than man? Um, Michael? <laughs> Probably it would be uh, fairest to say that the disorder takes different forms in women than in men. Yes, presentation with hysterical paralysis, for example, or pseudo seizures is more common in women than in men. The interesting genetic finding is that in the families in which hysteria runs in the women, antisocial personality disorder runs in the men. So whatever the fundamental defect is, whatever the personality defect, whatever the uh, deficit in, in biological makeup is, it seems to take a different form in women uh, from the form it takes in men. I am Dr. Chokalingam. I appreciate Srinivas for his excellent way of opening up the orations for questions. There's a recent trend I appreciate. I am a cardiologist, basically. I saw three days ago a doctor student called me, 19-year-old engineering student having a severe chest pain, palpitation, breathing difficulty. He witnessed his father of 52 years. He lost his father about three months ago. The doctor was reluctant whether it's a functional or organic. This happened at 3 a.m. I told him, please send it, don't take any risk. When I saw him at 3.15 a.m., I saw him had a massive heart attack. Why I'm telling this point is, no question of taking that in symptoms as a functional, but you may not miss, you should not miss the real killing disease. The psychological trauma, the mental tension, as a third year engineering student, if I had not taken the risk of, I mean, a precaution of seeing, you would have lost him. Another comment and question is, a person who had an enormous emotional upset gets the heart attack. After the heart attack, he becomes cardiac neurotic. So it becomes a vicious cycle the neurologist, psychiatrist, cardiologist must play a greatest role to break the cycle of it. And question to the presenter, hysteria, is it a curable? How often you have get rid of complete cure for them? How are a girl of 19 or 15 years never exposed to symptoms of diseases but able to mimic certain aspects of the diseases? How is it possible for her to say either paralysis or fits never witnessed in her lifetime? How do you explain that manifestation of it? Thank you. Well, thanks for your comments. Uh, is it curable? Well, you know, like, like uh, every other disease in medicine that I can think of, it comes in mild, moderate, and severe forms. So, uh, you know, there are people with relatively mild disorders who do quite well. There are patients, on the other hand, who are extremely chronic, despite everybody's best efforts. So, uh, you know, people can get better. Some people can get pretty much all better, but a lot of patients will be chronically impaired. Uh, as a layperson, I would just like to ask whether it is possible to speak to a person in coma and revive him from, from coma back to this thing by merely speaking and continuing to inspire him and speak to him. Is it possible? Because I, it has happened 
in my family, uh, the father was a doctor, the son is a doctor. The father went into coma after he had severe pneumonia. This is in the United States, this happened. And the son, being a doctor, was talking to him constantly, telling him the progress. And though he was in a ventilator, he was in coma. For 15 days, he continued to talk to him. And of course, the treatment was going on. And one, one day, suddenly, he came back out of coma. And he was, he was on the way to recovery, and he's OK now. So, so the question is whether people can recover when others had given up on them. Yes. yes. Well, this is pretty far from my expertise, and I don't want to say too much about it, because I'd end up being wrong and misleading. But it certainly is an area of considerable interest, especially because, as you may know, as others may know, there have recently been a number of cases in whom, a number of patients in whom, despite the absence of behavioral evidence of brain function, there was functional neuroimaging evidence of brain function, so that, for example, Michael, you know, may, may know more about this than I do, but it, it, uh, it was, for example, you, you say to the person who's lying there in coma, do you like tennis? And nothing happens. And you say, well, this person's in coma. And you attach the person to a brain scanner, and you say, imagine yourself playing tennis, and the tennis playing parts of the brain light up. And that kind of finding leads people to enormous excitement about the possibility of patients who appear to be comatose or minimally uh, conscious uh, eventually waking up. Unfortunately, most of the time, those hopes on the parts of families will be disappointed. Uh, how, what the percentages are, this is outside my expertise, exactly how to approach the problem, it's outside of my expertise. But there probably are some people who can now or soon be identified to be more alive than we think. But for the most part, when they look bad, they're bad. And uh, families will end up being disappointed uh, if they get their hopes up too high. <coughs> Dr. Sunil Narayan from uh, Jipnar. Exactly uh, 10 days from now, Professor Krishnamurti Srinivas ha has been uh, visiting Professor to our institution. And I had the opportunity to show to him a, a patient uh, around uh, 55 years old, <coughs> who was the son in law of one of the founder politicians of Pondicherry, uh, a person with uh, chronic smoking and uh, diabetes who had, I'm sure Prof. Srinivas will be remembering him, he had a left lower limb monoparesis and uh, there was some white matter, demyelination changes, small vessel disease. And uh, this uh, problem of uh, left lower limb monoparesis clinically was something looking like a catatonia or paratonia or some kind of uh, apraxia of the left lower limb. Classical upper motor neuron signs were not there. But though there were bilateral soft pyramidal signs of going plan down, etc. So Professor Srinivas had a long talk with him and advised to be seen by the medical social worker and uh, also <clears throat> to continue with the physiotherapy. And I would like to inform Professor Srinivas that the next day after he had left, this man had shown very considerable improvement and he is now walked and in fact the day before I came over he got discharged also. So the effect of uh, proper counseling and the psychological changes that uh, imparts into the uh, patient, especially by a person whom person develops a lot, tr lot more, definitely he had developed a lot more trust in Professor Srinivas than myself, uh, does uh, do wonders to some of these patients. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gopal from uh, Anna University, professor at Anna University Computer Science. With the permission of Professor Krishnamurti Srinivas and Dr. E.S. Krishnamurti, I would request you to enlighten me on is there a specialization which is based on psychology of programming. I'm a computer science professor. We tend to abstract things. The number of microphones in this room is just an array. It is just something which is 
mapped completely out of the real world, and we program based on that. There's a book by Gerald Weinberg with the title Psychology of Programming, and we do think that we need to explore this specially, separately. This is even farther outside any expertise that I have. I, I, I'm sorry, I just, I just don't know the answer to your question. Sir, um, uh, hello, I'm Satyendra. Here. I'm Satyendra, I'm a polyglot, I'm a student of philosophy and literature. Uh, near Bangalore, about 70 kilometers, there is a village uh, where uh, about some 100 to 200 uh, patients will come. I mean, ordinary village people with lot of hysteria. And there is a Muslim uh, priest, you know, he accuses everybody. I have seen, we have made a film with a French uh, psychiatrist. I have seen people behaving so rough, you know, banging their head, all kind of things. But no, uh, no medical uh, help. But in a few days, they believe, they, get, they recovered. I was there, many people recovered. People come from Bombay, Delhi, and people who are not cured in the biggest hospitals were cured there. How do you explain this phenomenon? See, medicine is largely a cultural subject and therefore what happens in this country and what you do for patients here may not be relevant, for example, from where Dr. O.C., Professor O.C. comes from. So what you're saying we've seen as doctors, but to give an explanation is going to be very difficult. No, human beings are everyone's same, the, sir. The, one, in the, America one, of the, here. Yeah. one of the problems is you need a follow-up in medicine. In other words, the mm. person should come back five years later and mm. said he's very much the better and he's okay. But follow-up in India is care of the footpath. Mm. People don't come back. And people don't come back for follow-up and find mm. it very difficult. Mm. Thank you. One more question and we close. Uh, my name is Dr. Praveen. I'm from Cochin. Uh, what is the current understanding of the mechanism of, uh, of suggestibility in pseudo-seizures? Um, the fMRI study which you showed, was it done during the interictal period when a suggestion was given or was it, do, was it done during the ictus? Well, the fMRI data I showed were from a single patient with continuous left arm paralysis. So it was during the ictus, so to speak, or it was during the presence of the symptom. Um, the mechanism of suggestibility. Suggestibility is highly heritable. And to the best of my understanding, it is not highly correlated with other personality traits. So I, I don't know what the mechanism is, but it seems to be a human trait that, like many other traits, varies within the population. Some people have a lot of it, some people have a little of it, and it's under some genetic control, considerable genetic control. So it's, is it possible that these pseudo seizures are more common in that group of yeah. personalities who are more suggestible? Well, you're, you're raising a... Um, let me slightly shift the, the ground of your question. Suppose we had a patient who, or a subject, who had been hypnotized into left hand paralysis. So you've got healthy controls moving their left hand normally. You've got simulators who are faking left hand paralysis. You've got hysterical left hand paralysis. And then a fourth group would be uh, patients who are hypnotized into you can't move your left arm. What, what would that group look like? And I can tell you that the article from which I showed that fMRI, which came out in the latter part of, uh, of uh, 2009, has reference to the same group's work on hypnosis, quote, in press. So we'll both know soon. Thank you very much.